so my name is Jason Campagna. Um, I'm responsible for our cloud practice at Worldwide. Um, I've got a couple different kinds of folks in my team, deep technical architects that live and breathe a certain stack. So think VMware guys or Microsoft guys or Cisco guys or, or open stack resources, folks like that. We pay attention to a lot of the different stacks. And you'll hear me talk about a few of them. But generally speaking, I think I have one slide, this entire deck that actually has anything related to actual gear and actual parts. The rest of it, doesn't. there's no vendor logos, no nothing. So just to kind of set the stage a little bit. The other kind of resource on my team is uh, a technology consultant, a principal consultant as we call them, that live and breathe how to get to the cloud. And that's primarily what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, most of it's based on what we're seeing with our customer base and, and how they've either tried and failed or, or what have you. So um, I am going to ground a little bit. I'm going to dive into the people process technology stuff and then talk a little bit about tactically how we're actually getting it done for customers. Um, I really encourage you guys to interrupt me, ask questions. Um, these sessions often end up being a speak to kind of a thing. I, I really like a dialogue. Um, so if you're like, hey, what about that thing? F really feel free, raise your hand or frankly just speak up. It's a small room. It, it really is, is a non-issue. Cool? All right. So how many of you guys actually have a cloud today of any kind? You guys, how about you use a cloud? Every hand should go up because pretty much everyone does in the room. All right. So. I'm a big believer in why did we get here. So here's the cloud. I live in Florida, by the way, full disclosure, so I, I get to use Andrew. Um, this conversation of cloud, this hurricane across the marketplace, all that kind of jazz, the reality of it is it is really what's happening. And whether you like it or not, it is a change. This does not mean I'm going to the cloud. So when I say the word cloud, I do not mean sign up for a commercial service provider, although that's an option. I do not mean go to the private cloud or you have to build it up, although that's an option. And I also don't care about the the type of cloud, deployment model, I, none of that really matters. Oh, and by the way, the purest definition of NIST, I also don't subscribe to that. So now that I just threw away the landscape of the marketplace and all the, the things that we've chosen to, to rely on, right? If we start to look at why this happened and the center of this hurricane being virtualization, and again, I also don't mean hypervisor. I actually mean virtualization of any kind. So if I can abstract away from the gear, including software on the infrastructure or a hypervisor or software abstraction layers, the whole bottom line is I can now do a bunch of cool stuff. So back in the day, we had things like mesh and grid and rack and you know, SOA initiatives and utility computing and all that stuff that were arguably clouds, even by today's definitions. They were just written at the software stack and the software layer. And then all of a sudden, we came along with this virtualization thing. And we could take a legacy workload. We can encapsulate it and make it portable and stick it on top of gear and move it around and do some cool stuff with it. I like to look at it as we cloudified, don't throw anything at me, the application. And instead of redeveloping it, that we now could layer stuff in it to get the same capability set. So if we look at why cloud is happening, for me, that's the fundamental reason of why it's happening. You're going to hear me talk a little bit, or actually a lot about, legacy apps versus a redeveloped app. And there's a, there's a, a very important distinction there around how you actually deal with your environments and how you move to the cloud that really is right in that separation. That's the reason I even use this slide. Um, I like to joke around, so cloud guy, cloud guys on my team, rainbows and unicorns and leprechauns and all the things that cloud supposedly promises is what we typically joke about. We know why we're here. I'm not here to review all of that with you. Uh, but speed, of course, is a big one. I hear cost all the time. And cost in a redevelopment effort, cloud is cheaper. Cost in a redeployment of a legacy app to the cloud is not necessarily cheaper, especially on the public side. Um, that's one of the underlying threats, especially in DoD, that we get hit with a lot. Hey, we're going to the cloud. We're going to save money. Fantastic. Have you gone through application rationalization? Do you understand what that really means? And there's usually a lot of dialogue around that that, to us, ends up resulting in a different deployment model. You guys may have seen some of this kind of stuff before. The top of the list is cloud being always cheaper. Um, this conversation of, OK, if it's not a cloud, it's not always good. Legacy apps are OK, too. And if you have a a multi-million dollar or even higher cost of redevelopment of a legacy app, there's a real justification for, yes, it's on the list, but it's on the list way down the list, versus, hey, we're just going to do a wholesale migration to the cloud. Um, this discussion of, hey, you actually have a cloud strategy, you wouldn't believe the number of organizations, whether it's enterprise or a service provider or DOD. And, and by the way, I didn't mention that earlier. My team actually crosses all of them. So we borrow from what we learn in the service provider space and the enterprise space and apply it to federal and vice versa as well, which is, is an important thing as we dig into it. Um, the other thing is that, hey, I want to do just a single cloud vendor. 
Um, in fact, it's actually just the opposite. Um, the most successful ones we've seen have from the start figured out, okay, I'm gonna have to borrow this piece over here and this piece over here, and I'm gonna have to refine my people and process in order to actually attack this. Um, and failing faster is a term we like to use a lot. The most successful clouds we've seen are ones that actually figure out how to misstep and kind of fall on their face a little bit so that they learn some of these aspects when you truly put a cloud in place. You'll have to learn one way or the other. And others down the list around security and mission at critical apps and so forth. Um, the application of cloud principles to IT as a whole is the thing to really keep in mind. How can we take IT and form it and modernize it, if you will? And it crosses all boundaries. So just a reminder, the 30-second version. Is anyone in the room not familiar with this? The what, the where, the how, the, that so forth of cloud? I suspected so. You guys are probably getting tired of seeing these kinds of slides, right? Every vendor you ever talk to has got it. Yeah, I figured as much. This where in particular is the one that I like to just almost ignore entirely. The what, again, the purest conversation that I mentioned before, not too worried about this. So for example, uh, from a, a, an elasticity perspective, can I scale the cloud up? It's unlimited. It's all about perspective. So from the person consuming the cloud, it looks unlimited. I'd argue that's unlimited. Doesn't really matter. Do you really think Amazon is truly unlimited? No. Same applies to the internal side. So this ability to spin the cloud up and make it larger or smaller or what have you is really all about how we define it. So the same applies to private side. I can have all these attributes, and if you don't see the investment of a particular attribute, that's fine. Um, the purest definition, I think, has gotten a lot of folks in trouble when we've seen them actually try to build or consume real cloud services. Um, this type of service, and I'm not spending any time on the slide, really, but this conversation of customer, vendor, and so forth around the consumption model, this dialogue I've seen lots of folks talk to and dive way into storage and network and servers and let's figure out exactly how this whole thing work, is working. But really the user is what matters. So as we look at the end user and the consumption of a SaaS app or the development, developers and their consumption of platform or end user IT and their consumption of infrastructure services, we often see a lot of missteps between does platform, how is the IT department consuming platform as a service? And it usually comes down to they don't even know how they're going to use that because it's the wrong audience. The same applies to software as a service. It's really an end user community. And as we look at folks trying to figure out how am I going to build a services framework, what's the ar enterprise architectural conversation look like, what's the flow down from the service I'm providing down to gear and everything else in between, and of course the app that runs, some of these models are often attempted to be applied, but they're simply not appropriate. The efficiencies that this provides, infrastructure as a service, whether it's public, private, or whatever it is, provides the IT shop is one of the most important foundational elements. And by the way, by definition, often platform consumes infrastructure as a service, just depending upon how you're set up. But what gets interesting, and Salesforce is a great example of that, salesforce.com, uh, Pivotal, OpenShift, and others, there's a lot of interesting stuff occurring where you actually do come up several layers. Back to the hurricane slide. Remember legacy app and redeveloped app? The architecture that exists from here up, if you don't have infrastructure as a service, is entirely different. So if you built a VMware environment today, and it's a legacy infrastructure as a service style environment, and you have all those attributes I talked about before, you have a cloud, and you say, hey, I want to build a platform as a service. Yes, you can layer that on top, but the cost model isn't necessarily the same. It's why you see VMware looking at OpenStack as, as having their own distribution. The architecture is different the value from the high availability actually moves up a layer into the application itself. So things like redundancy and backup and uh, performance characteristics and control of those things actually arrive in the application. So back to the re redevelopment. How many of your apps are aware of things like that? HA, aware of the fact that if a server or a zone dies is okay, are aware of performance in this zone and knows, know to flow traffic over here? I'd be willing to bet very few applications. Think Facebook, think Google, that's how those apps are typically written, as well as redeveloped for the cloud style applications. So as you arrive up these layers, and as you're thinking about how am I gonna architect to cater to developers, whether it's with or against the public cloud, I don't really care, but the operational model has changed, and the way that you actually provide those services has also changed. What gets interesting is I can actually provide a level of that at this, and I have to do that anyway for all those legacy apps that are gonna take a very long period of time. So I guess what I'm getting at is people are often focused on the utopian versions of cloud and leaving the 80% to sit and languish and not extract efficiency from in the short term. 
So this application conversation I mentioned a couple times, one of the things we don't see a lot of is a realistic perspective of the app. Um, this is an application rationalization dialogue, if you will, in a very short kind of bucket. So if we look at, hey, have you done an economic evaluation? Back to that legacy conversation. Taking the legacy app and moving it to the cloud, public or private, in some cases is more expensive. Again, legacy app. If I redevelop, hold another dialogue, platform, infrastructure, or platform software as a service. This is specifically infrastructure as a service. And depending upon public or private, sometimes that legacy app will actually cost you more putting in AWS. In fact, it's one of the most common conversations I have of, hey, I have a million dollars or 500000 or $200,000 a month in, in costs, and I didn't think it was going to cost that much. I didn't realize that this particular application touches those 10 things on the back and all this I.O. traffic is, a, is resulting in it. Uh, building metrics and understanding what that economic evaluation is, is is really one of the principles of figuring out that app. Next flavor is the trust side of things. And I know in this room we all love the trust and security side, right? That economic evaluation is the cornerstone of it. And there are, you know, there's legacy workloads, but as we get into the other dialogues, there's, there's filters that this goes through. And just to flush it out, the trust side of things, hey, that, that one's pretty straightforward, especially for folks in this room. I'm going to go private for certain workloads specifically because of security requirements. So you've made it through, hey, we know it's cheaper. And not we think it's cheaper, we know it's cheaper. Then we're going to look at security. Does it make sense in and out of the cloud? And then last but not least, and the one that everyone forgets about is the functionality side. Dependencies between VMs actually acts as a lot more than you'd think. Um, and depending upon this, this rationalization, sometimes there's a dependency mapping project that occurs. Hey, let's cast a net and let's look at what, who's talking to what across the entire application space. And I immediately know, well, this one's got so much cross ch chatter, this is going to be really difficult and I rank it accordingly. What's interesting is you get to public and private, you, you end up with the public workloads. Notice just the little itty bitty box at the top. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I mentioned briefly this application mapping. Um, this is part of an assessment as well as ver various workshops that we do, uh, particularly around dependency mapping, but also uh, performance. But if we look at it and we, we scatter plot the apps and we figure out, okay, the value of, of reducing costs and increasing agility for this app and the perceived complexity, whether it's judged based on data or based on uh, observation and discussion, in other words, people's opinions. Eventually, I do a survey and, and produce this kind of a scatter plot. If we looked at it as I think the rest of the market often talks about, okay, so I'm going to start up there, the ones that are the easiest, and I'm going to gradually move across. What we found is actually it's more like this. And as soon as you arrive at, I got through email and a few other things that is really easy, and you start to tackle anything that has a traditional application base, um, all hell breaks loose. It becomes very challenging to move it to public. And we've actually seen folks spend a ton of time, and they're still spending a ton of time, trying to figure out and thinking that, hey, you know what, I, I've only gone down a step or two, um, and they're already down here, and they're looking at, I want to move that to public, because that's what I'm supposed to do. And the reality of it is, there's a, a little bit of a cost model we're going to talk about here in a minute between public and private, where the delta is not as much as you think for legacy workloads. I, I feel like I've got to keep qualifying that, because it really is a different conversation. If you redevelop, going to the cloud can be uh, orders of magnitude cheaper, if you will. But redeveloping, we all know, is expensive. So back to this conversation. If we slide these guys over and we start to look at this, the conversation everybody's having is, I'm going to take all 100% or 80% of my environment and try to figure out how to use a commercial CSP. The reality of it is, because of these application requirements, there's actually a much smaller subset of things that would actually go to a commercial infrastructure as a service model, and a whole lot that would be an internal private model. Um, and again, depends upon the workloads and depends upon the ratio, and gradually through time, and when I say time, I mean three, five, seven years, you're going to see this shrink down like this, because there will be more that can go in public, whether security requirements are addressed or economic. Amazon's price is going like this, especially as it's negotiated or you just consume a lot of it. So just depending upon those, those filters, those filters will change a bit, and part of the new model of IT is a continuous rationalization of apps. There's metrics gathered, and you're always making a decision for, should I redeploy this app in a different model? Gathering the information and actually putting the systems in place operationally to get that done is actually what the cloud is more all about versus choosing a model or, or building an infrastructure stack. So I mentioned before around kind of a model value. This is actually an ancient slide. I've actually used this for several years. It's still accurate. Um, it's actually changed a little bit. In, in fact, probably more in, in pure private's fa favorite. 
So if we look at the, okay, it cost me X here, I'm going to save 20% or whatever it is. The delta between pure public and pure private is actually not as much as many people think for a particular legacy style workload. Very different here for you to redevelop again. So if I go to hybrid and I start to pick and choose components of the app or individual apps between the two, I can shrink my cost down a little bit more. But I just feel, feel like highlighting 2% delta, if we just say, hey, it's going to be more secure and it's in my data center, I'd be willing to bet a lot of CIOs will pay the 2% for the security delta. Let's call it 10%. I bet you most would call it, it would be okay with that as well. Um, there's a lot of folk stuff that's being skipped around the private side. And this hybrid approach is where the pain starts, but it's also where the most value is. And so this step model we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, when we look at legacy apps, just broad spectrum, um, buy the base, rent the peak is the tagline my team uses. So for infrastructure as a service, the majority that you've got, having that in an internal infrastructure as a service model is our normal, what we actually see success in, as well as what we recommend. And then, hey, as you have certain peaks, you have temporary workloads that need to be created. And note, this is, is, is just a good graph and, frankly, an easy, easy image pull to show it because it's an app-specific thing. Bursting the app out is a different conversation. It's not an easy thing to do. But running components of the app that, say, runs this as you get to certain peaks is the name of the game. So the 30 development workstations that will not stick around, that being the key term, putting them in Amazon versus growing your environment makes a lot of sense. Um, having 30 machines or 30,000 machines that you know are going to sit there and they're running 24-7 do not necessarily belong in the public cloud unless they've been written for it. Who of you is comparing VMware versus OpenStack as an example? Is anybody running that comparison today? Not at all? Okay. I won't use it as an example then. So we've talked a little bit about our, the application side of things um, because it's really where the conversation starts. This app transformation, and, and second, I, I saw, see Matt in the room from EMC. So second platform, third platform is an EMC coin term, at least from my perspective it is. But it, and it works. At the end of the day, it really is a conversation of how am I going to re-platform the application. We've talked to that, and I've beaten it to death. This extends out to the data side of things. How am I going to monetize my data or fulfill a mission in a more efficient way? How am I going to start to be able to use that information in new ways? Uh, Chief Pena was talking a little bit about a specific use case on the Army side and how they actually use big data. You're going to see that all over the place and it woven into the application. In fact, it's one of the major use cases if we redevelop the app, it's a big data blend and it's done in the public cloud. Um, Microsoft and Azure is a great example with machine learning among a few other things where there's a very serious dialogue around machine learning and the capabilities that the cloud can provide there. Those two are two big pieces. Foundationally, how am I going to transform my infrastructure? And I've got it up here just, for, just, so, just a reminder. Don't care if it's legacy. Don't care if it's public or private. The model and the where it is is not really as important as how am I going to actually transform the way that I provide physical infrastructure services in the case of the blue layer or virtual infrastructure, software-defined data center uh, in the case of the green layer? How am I going to do more than just provide an efficient physical, you know, converged infrastructure or de-siloed cell organization? How might we actually provide a layer up from that and, and abstract a, across, uh, do things what we've been doing with a hypervisor, but do them with storage, do them with networking, security, availability. And then on up the stack into the purple side, back to the rainbows and unicorns and let's go with cloud. How do I deliver IT as a service uh, um, and actually put out there a true enterprise architecture, a true approach that actually gives me self-service and all the things that cloud promises? These three layers are foundational for us, and you're going to see me talk a little bit more about them um, as we move forward and how we actually are, are architect an environment. Those three layers are fluid. I can actually build and do a specific stack here or here, depending upon what I want to do and depending upon what my requirements are. Uh, definition of requirements is often missing. And notice cybersecurity is, of course, a foundational element of this entire conversation. I mentioned operations. Um, this is probably the most underestimated aspect of cloud. It's often left off the table, um, and then I either buy or I move my stuff out to a cloud, and then I sit back and go, oh, I thought the cloud was supposed to solve all those problems. Um, and the reality is we all come back to this and try to figure out uh, what are the new roles I'm going to have? What processes am I actually going to do? Am I doing agile today? Do I have a DevOps initiative? How am I actually going to change this so that I actually extract the efficiencies from cloud that I was promised? That's all on the operations side. Um, I mentioned metrics a few times. One of the best ways to, to remove the emotion from the cloud conversation is to have enough in the way of metrics 
to understand exactly what's going on within the environment and start to make judgments based on fact versus, hey, I own this application, or hey, I have a, 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 a thing that I believe in my job is going to go away if the cloud comes. Um, one thing we've never seen is some mass exodus or removal of bodies. Um, it's almost like uh, folks are, are typically retrained and they're putting new roles. My favorite analogy to use is the assembly line approach. Um, we're uh, making cars today arguably in IT. We do multiple, we do all kinds of different cars. They're all custom. Uh, maybe we buy chassis here, we buy different tires for this one, a different engine, different paint, different choices. All custom, every single car is different. Cloud comes along and we've decided, all right, so we want to automate the whole thing. Putting automation in place, you don't just suddenly automate that approach. First you pick the three models or maybe two models you're actually going to produce. And then you look at the assembly line and all the steps that's taken. And you have to figure out there's a supply chain aspect to that. There's a, who, you know what, maybe I'm going to automate just welding and just painting. And I'm going to start to look at other components of that. As we're trying to solve this hybrid cloud conversation, it's a lot like trying to automate that assembly line. How do I uh, do it all at once? Well, the answer is you don't. Oh, and hey, by the way, the folks that are, on the, that are in the shop today and there's a bunch of individual bays, yes, I may close down three or four of those bays. Those guys, I'm going to send to class and I'm going to teach them how to train the robots to weld and paint in the assembly line. Oh, and hey, by the way, you guys have all watched the Discovery Channel, I'm assuming, right? You've seen some, some stuff happen. The, the, uh, the approach of installing the dashboard, a couple guys used to do that manually. Well, I still need a guy, but now I'm going to assist them with a tool, automation, and I'm going to give them something where they can maneuver the dashboard on their own and put it in the vehicle. Well, some guy has to program that thing, so suddenly one of the guys from those three bays is actually working with the robot, and a couple more are actually working with the tool itself. So when you start talking new roles and you start talking cloud and transformation, it's, it's an analogy to maybe stick in your head around what is the change you'll have to go through, and it really is that significant um, using that analogy around automakers. So let's start talking about th the bigger picture. How many of you guys are virtualizing today? Pretty much everybody. We're pretty much all virtualizing. Let's virtualize everything. So as we kind of go through this, um, this VM resource management, I start to put some things in place typically when I virtualize. How can I do some of the basics, often a creating of a template, uh, things like that, that come along with virtualizing. Um, operationalized virtualization is often a different conversation. Are you truly using all the features? Perhaps one of the main things we see is there's virtualization out there and it's actually just pretty raw. There isn't a lot of operational footprint. There isn't a lot of uh, efficiency being pushed outside of, hey, now I'm running 30 on one. Um, it, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, intelligence, if you will. As we move to the private cloud side, we start to do some things and start to arrive at some basic levels of self-service and we start to, do, um, uh, start to tip our, dip our toe, if you will, on the development side. Um, what should we be doing around DevOps? Uh, where does it fit in the model? That sort of thing. Um, the other thing that often comes along as you do real private cloud is multi-vendor private cloud. There is a stack you can purchase, but there's often a couple of private clouds that form, um, just depending upon the environment. And keep in mind, when we're looking at infrastructure as a service, yes, I need to virtualize and abstract, but if we walk away from the purest definition, there's stages of private. So I can go all the way with the new cloud and put it in the corner over here and start to learn it operationally, and I can take certain mechanisms from that and apply it to some traditional virtualization environment that I'm not ready to go with. Um, I guess what I'm after there is don't be so stuck in the phases where you lose the efficiencies of some of those others. And as we move forward into standardizing things, and it takes time, how do I standardize the infrastructure, how do I standardize my consumption, how do I standardize operations, then I start to get into the hybrid cloud side and extend that environment and extend my policy, importantly, security and network in particular, out to the public cloud um, as I figure out what applications need to run that, that direction. So on the hybrid cloud side, one of the other things I'm doing is also studying the environment and usually pulling back in all the shadow IT that often results. In federal, it's a little different because there's, there's you know, it's not as easy to use Dropbox, uh, that kind of thing. But it still exists, believe it or not, where we've seen it, um, particularly in civilian, uh, among other places. Last but not least, as we arrive at IT as a service, the brokerage pricing model conversation, so the ability to have your own app store within the environment comes along. And I mentioned continuous optimization. Can think of a continuous application rationalization project. Um, one of my favorite things is seeing the individual projects where we're going to do an application rationalization project, and then we're going to be done, and then we're going to do, do something with it. And for me, it's not really the problem. The problem is there's a continuous process that will, result, will be there forever, 
related to application rationalization because of the way IT has changed because of cloud. The metrics and the judgments and the continued conversation around does this app belong here and having on almost a dashboard of, hey, I can see these tools that we can buy eventually saying, this app actually might run better over there. Imagine DRS on the VMware side or some similar tool set actually telling you this app would be cheaper in Azure and you got an app in Amazon and it telling you this would be cheaper on private cloud A in your environment. Um, I really do see it going that direction, and I see it within the next five years, or probably less, that kind of intelligence uh, between these environments. So for us, this is the big picture around the stages, if you will. Uh, I mentioned people process technology very loosely. Um, when we talk about the tech, and you guys know worldwide, most of you, um, worldwide fundamentally is a technology company. And so I've just spent a good 30, 20 minutes 26 minutes on people, process, applications, and things that have really nothing to do with tech. Part of that is because in our experience working with customers, cloud management platforms are really just the tip of this iceberg, and the, the process and the business management and the people are really the pain points. Um, for us, in order to sell stuff associated with the cloud, we found that we have to help a customer extract value from these technologies. And for us, this is where that conversation is. If you, we split it across people, process, technology, and we talk about today's environment versus in the cloud world, and I'm not here to walk through this in detail or what have you. I'm mainly trying to expose you to some of the conversations that in our cloud workshops we're typically having. A detailed discussion of people and where you're at today and understanding how, from a transformation perspective, how that's going to be in the cloud role. What roles am I going to have? Do any of you have an automation engineer, an automation architect in your environments? Things like that often come along for the ride and figuring out who those roles might be. Same applies to uh, the process side. So um, you probably have automation tools today, but I'm willing to bet you don't have an automation strategy. It's not baked into the way you think. So similar to that assembly line conversation, there's a, a discussion of how do I make this more efficient at all times versus how do I customize every little bit and piece like there was in the earlier model around building cars. The entire assembly line and all the guys on it, all the management structure are all based on how do I create efficiency in this environment. That's not how we think in IT today. So this philosophy of automation and transitioning from hardly any to automation and self-service and baked in consumption models and the, the service framework itself and it being a service centric model. Some of it is enterprise architecture. If you ask an enterprise architect, they'd be like, of course, we got to do all this. Well, they're kind of coming in vogue again around, okay, what does my enterprise architecture really look like and how am I ripping it apart to do cloud? Last but not least, and of course near and dear to our hearts, is okay, the technology that we've been dealing with, there's a lot of complexity associated with it. How do I have a converged architecture? You see this show up in the marketplace, of course, with VBOC and FlexPods and converged infrastructure. But is virtualization everywhere? And I had a virtualization abstraction on there. I actually took it off because it didn't fit. But think of virtualization not as traditional hypervisor, but abstracting absolutely everything. How do I do that? And then pools of resources and silos and so forth. There's actually some associated with the infrastructure operations team. How do I actually pull the silos apart? How do I create teams that's focused on the infrastructure side of things um, in a way that they haven't done before? Cross-training comes to mind, among other things. So you've got a storage guy that actually knows the network. Um, and a lot of the arguments between teams that many of us deal with today actually goes away. Um, we call it a tiger team or center, center of excellence or whatever you'd like to say. Um, but that conversation has often been done about 10 times and has never been really done successfully. And part of it is because the rally cry of cloud actually is kind of forcing it now versus before it was like, yeah, we got a center of excellence. It's a cross team thing. It's over in the corner over there. Um, that kind of a dialogue is, is just simply different today. So out of our workshop, and this is a, a bit more detail on, okay, if I'm going to walk through moving to the cloud, I'm going to have to do some stuff. There's lots of leadership going on. We're seeing all kinds of documents come out around st uh, cloud strategy and policies and different things. So I, believe it or not, I actually think there's a lot of work that's, that's happening there. A lot of leadership, a lot of definition of services is starting to happen. It's kind of perhaps where we are at a certain point. And looking at evaluation and creating metrics and so forth. One of the things we see that fails almost every time is going straight to number eight and develop, de developing a technology plan. And in, in our environment, inside of Worldwide, I mentioned it's gear, right? we often go and gravitate directly towards that. And unfortunately, um, for the customer, it's not the way to be successful. What we've had a lot of success with where a customer does want to do that is let's build up the cloud and let's put it over here in the corner and let's start to figure out how that's going to work and how it's going to affect operations. How is it going to actually be consumed in my environment? And then sometimes, uh, and I mentioned failing fast early on, 
Sometimes it's a question of quickly walking through this list. And notice number 10, it's rather intentional. OK, so let's be looking strategically across how we're going to do this. But very tactically, let's, make a, let's take action right now so that we can go through this list again instead of sitting around for six months creating a strategy. In fact, I had a customer conversation late yesterday. And the, the ask was, hey, can you give me two guys for 12 weeks to come in and define our cloud strategy? Very large global enterprise customer, which is the best thing ever for a customer to come to us and say, we love what you said. Here's some money. Come figure it out. And my response was, I don't feel good taking your money, and here's why. It's not defined. I don't want to spend three, four, or five months defining this for you. I'd like to step away from that a bit. Let's have a workshop. Um, we'll give you a, a day of time, and we're going to walk through what your roadmap looks like. We're going to provide you a document that says, hey, at a high level, here's what we heard. Here's your desired state as you've defined it. Um, here are the strategic recommendations based on what we heard. We haven't measured anything. We don't know for sure, but here's what we heard. And tactically, here are the steps you should take to move forward, one of them being an assessment, more than likely, based on what they wanted to be going with. This conversation is really a foundational element of how we tackle this topic. If we look at a couple just kind of samples of this around the people side of things, just because I mentioned the assembly line approach, these roles of a, a service architect or a, 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 a swapping a role or perhaps modifying a role that would still exist around capacity planning or what have you. Same thing around challenges. Uh, what are the services we're going to provide? Yes, email is one, but, but what exactly, what does the menu look like? What, what catalog am I going to pr put out there? The planning aspects of cloud actually have to start with that and have to start with what am I trying to provide? What are my requirements? Really, what use cases am I actually trying to execute against? Uh, I mentioned the center of excellence already, so I won't bore us on that. Here's another version of that slide. If, oh, it's kind of screwed up. There must be a Mac thing. Um, system admin and recovery admin and network and security guys and so forth, them transitioning to a cloud architect or a cloud admin or an IT automation engineer. Um, back to the robot analogy, these are the robot guys. They're the ones dealing with and managing and figuring out how to continuously automate certain aspects of it. When they're done with one particular tax, they take their IP and they go and actually go work on another one to automate something else. That's really the new world of IT, if you will, from just a people perspective. We can go quite deep with this. And again, it's not our core. I'm not Accenture. I'm not here to sell you organizational transformation services or anything. But for us, these are important aspects of actually adopting and consuming cloud. Another conversation around the technology side of things, and again, right off that kind of punch list, and of course, near and dear to our heart, um, you guys heard about the ATC. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what that means in the context of cloud. This thing started with, hey, I want to create a next-gen data center. So we actually built an active, active environment. It actually was EMC-based, since you're in the room, I'll mention it. Um, how do we actually put true active, active together, show failover, show things never actually happen? Uh, or ne never, never, uh, never goes down. So we actually watch a video in a VM, and you turn some stuff off, and the whole site fails, and everything works great. Um, and there's actually a couple apps on top of that. But so DR in the the purple in the center there is actually how it started. So showing the networking and the security and the overlays was was, was foundational. Then we decided, you know what? Let's actually put some software-defined storage and security, and mm, let's make that a private private cloud and layer these various technologies on it. So we have arrived at the point now where we actually have not only the entire stack associated with NextGen Data Center, we can actually go quite a bit deeper. So I mentioned earlier around those kind of three layers. So as we get a get mo bit more into the technology, if we look at how we mature this and kind of grow it up, that blue layer around how do I provide better physical infrastructure services was a key part of that conversation. This can take a lot of different forms. It may be that you build your own converged infrastructure and think about it as a de-siloed environment. It may be that you buy a VBlock or a FlexPod or whatever related to building converged infrastructure in your environment. The important thing is that you adopt the efficiencies associated with the cookie cutter model. And when I need more gear, I'm not thinking about how to redesign the environment. I'm thinking about how I add another one. So it's the food pellet mentality related to converged infrastructure. The important thing to us is it's simplifying the environment. There are a few other things in here that just you know keep it simple on the slide, so to speak, or in that too. Database consolidation. Doing general basic IT more efficiently, some of which has often been missing. Running three or four versions of Linux, not 10. Running two or ideally one version of Windows, not two or three. Those kinds of things are actually in that as well. How do I simplify IT as a whole? As I abstract away from that, and when I start to enter, the hypervisor is certainly in that. I start to look at software-defined storage and availability. How do I abstract and provide that software-defined data center? That's a big piece of that conversation. Think of it as an object 
an object-oriented uh, model, how do I, when I get up to these upper layers, how do I write once and not have to think it about again is a big part of this abstraction layer. Um, one of the main things we see pain associated with is spending a lot of money at the automation layer without simplifying or abstracting. And then if I change anything underneath it, I get to go up and rewrite the workflow. That stuff's not cheap. Millions of dollars our customers have spent on the automation side of things, and in many cases, against our advice. Or they write automation to four or five places instead of one place, and then call that from, the, a lot of times there's a couple automation layers. I may write it into a bucket and actually call to that bucket, that kind of thing. So we flush it out a bit and go upstream to automate. Self-service metrics orchestration, things I mentioned before. How do we actually deliver IT as a service? Um, how do I start to put the frameworks in place and crawl into that layer, put specific use cases that are gonna provide immense value short term, and then start to go through the process of evaluating others. And I end up fairly quickly with quite a number of services in there that are successful, both from a performance standpoint, cost standpoint, and more importantly, agility. Moving fast is a big part of this conversation. So for us, simplify, abstract, and automate is really the foundational elements of how we get to the cloud um, at, at the end of the day and what we've actually seen be successful. This is affectionately known as the birthday cake slide, by the way. So if we look at this and start to lay a little infrastructure on it, and this is the main technical slide, it doesn't even have vendor logos on it, related to this topic, and we start to take and, and layer on the simplify, abstract, and automate, same kind of stuff, but a little bit more detail around the hypervisor and where it sits, various storage components of this, availability conversation, the uh, security side, et cetera from an abstraction perspective, and then into cloud management, and notice some separation between cloud management and self-service. In many cases, I may have APIs or different connectors. My favorite example of this is the VMware and OpenStack conversation. I'll probably have a layer that's self-service and an orchestration piece on top, and I may have different clouds underneath that actually plug upstream into that self-service stack. One of the POCs we're running in the ATC right now is actually a comparison at the self-service layer, and a main part of the dialogue is actually already what, what are you actually using for an automation stack from a virtualization perspective? Oh, and hey, by the way, there's actually element managers that sit in the abstraction side of things. I need to write to the element manager. There's n there, none of those exist. So if you want to provision or manage the infrastructure, you're actually going to have to write code for that or use a particular tool that has it baked in. Those are all pain points. And if I try to write that on the upstream side, you're going to spend a lot of money down below. Uh, that kind of conversation and dive into those things is what we're able to do for you within the ATC related to cloud. How many of you guys know or have been looking at cloud management platforms? Has there been much of that? Just a few. All right. If we look at just briefly the space, and as we start to talk about the technology side, the cloud management side is really where rubber meets the road in figuring out what do I need to do and what am I going to do around cloud. Uh, moving to the public cloud, even if, let's say, you're sitting there right now saying, well, that's, none of this matters. I'm just going to sign up for public, and I'm done. If you truly can put everything in one cloud, I'd probably agree, but the chances of that are essentially probably zero. You're going to usually have multiples. You have several. This, the, the ability to have a management platform that spans those, even if you manage multiple public, is really where this conversation goes. And we start to look at, okay, well, what is this all about? Well, I still have policy. I still need elasticity. I still have asset issues. I still have the need to automate. I still have all these things. Oh, by the way, I have to have governance. The management platforms provide all of that. Um, and notice some things around redesign of processes. Um, the pain associated with putting that assembly line in is rather immense. It's a real undertaking, a real change in the way IT works. So if I'm going to sit down and figure out, OK, I've got a 72 set Visio and I want to dump it in a tool, it's going to cost me a bunch of money. Um, maybe I should revisit what my process is to begin with. And instead of 72 steps, I need to trim that thing down. And in fact, what we often see is let's put an on-premise Amazon-like environment in place, let's build a stack, and let's actually figure out how that's going to look um, as we actually uh, try to consume it. So in other words, what does our process look like? Well, you know what, let's look at that over there, and maybe we can mold our process around the tool set instead of having it reinvented. Um, and I mentioned roles and skills and so forth, so I won't, I won't bore you guys with that. This is a, a, one of the, my favorite slides. It's rather neutral. It doesn't have a lot of inflammatory stuff on it. But it gives you some perspective of all the various vendors that are out there. And we look at the infrastructure vendors like VMware and strength around platform integration versus weakness around, okay, hey, it, it may not plug into this thing over here quite as well. Same thing with the ITOM, the traditional management vendors. 
Um, one of the reasons I think we've been so successful with our customers related to cloud is we don't have a traditional systems management business to protect. So the, the BMC, CA, IBM, HP style big suites, if you will, um, there's a lot of pain associated with that because of the fact that they're so complex. Yet at the same time, they really are the most flexible depending upon what you're actually trying to do. As we dig down to open source and so forth, and actually emerging vendors, you saw a slide early in the day around folks that have been acquired, Cloudpia, Dynamic Ops. We actually had Dynamic Ops as well as Cloudpia in the ATC before they were even on the radar of being acquired uh, because of how much we're testing the marketplace. Same applies to others that are in this space. Um, there's some like Sequentia or C Street that's a random video automation thing we pay attention to, among many others. Same thing around integrated infrastructure. There are automation things that are out there. UCS Director comes to mind on the Cisco side. Uh, Vision, of course, uh, on, the, um, on the EMC side that actually provide infrastructure automation and I can actually do things with the actual converged infrastructure that I can call upstream from those other stacks. And I guess what I, what I kind of surround this with is at the end of the day, you're gonna end up doing certain things in this uh, that isn't one suite. You're gonna end up picking perhaps a, an element management piece here and you're gonna have another piece here because you need some open stack because development guys want open shift for whatever reason and upstream you're gonna tie that into some larger stack that actually provides self-service. Um, going one place and getting all this is pretty unrealistic, and that integration is more immense than, than perhaps it ever has been before. From the ATC perspective, the majority of this list, uh, about half of it or so, is actually something we've either had or have stood up right now in the ATC. Um, there's no other organization or lab that I know of actually in the world that has that uh, today. Just a kind of fun value prop. Um, I've, had a, I've got a few things here around choosing a CMP, um, but I think I'll probably skip most of it. Um, unless you guys really want to hear about it. I'm guessing no. Okay. So here are four specific clouds that we have a very significant footprint around. Um, if you, most of the folks that we hear about today are comparing and contrasting between these or how do they blend together. So we have a significant expertise in all four of these. Um, if you're considering any of these or actually digging around from a cloud perspective, these are the ones um, that, uh, that we have a like, dedicated staff for, dedicated stacks, large, really pods of gear, if you will. Just want to put it on the board uh, as, uh, as you consider that. All right, well, I'm between you and beverages, I believe. Feel free to reach out anytime, happy to help. <laughs> <laughs>